From our previous lectures, we understood post-structuralism and deconstruction to some extent. I think we have seen a lot of the theoretical differences between structuralism and post-structuralism, and especially its origin as to whether it was a continuation of structuralism or a revolution against it. And we understood that it was basically formed of the same ideology, but was more radical in approach. And in the meantime, we realized that we were thrust into a decentered universe where no fixed intellectual reference points existed and hence our peripheries and centers were all merged together, were interspersed and are, have been deconstructed or undermined. And we also saw how a certain anxiety is created about the relevance of language or the, or the <coughs> reliability of language on which we depended so much to understand the world. And because of this anxiety, how certain, uh, um, certain distrust is created by, um, this, this, uh, by this notion of uh, reason, and the idea of human being as an independent entity. We saw um, basically a little bit about the origin of structuralism and post-structuralism, we compared them and understood that while structuralism had its origin in linguistics, post-structuralism had its origin in philosophy. And especially, we were concerned with this one particular idea that is a recurring thought, recurring thought of, of uh, Nietzsche echoed um, again and again in Derrida's writings, that there are no facts, only interpretations, which could be misconstrued at times, but basically simply implied that the world is full of ambiguity and so is language. And especially this world is full of ambiguity mainly because of language to some extent, right? And instead of being anxious about it, Nietzsche seems to revel in this uh, in this freedom given by uh, uh, or made, made accessible to us through, through this lack of uh, uh, through this uh, unreliability of language. Right? Um, we also saw the tone and style and compared both structuralism and post-structuralism, whereas the first was more abstract and general and had a detached tone and, and uh, quite scientific and had a certain method and steps quite orderly and uh, well like it read more like a thesis, neutral and anonymous. The post-structuralist writing was more emotive and engaged and urgent and euphoric and more like a proper method except that it just simply fixes on one particular point, some point in the text itself and deals with its own metaphor, etymology or of, of, the, of a certain pun or allusion. It is flamboyant and self-consciously showy. This is something that makes post-structuralism real fun to read or to even experiment with. And as far as the attitude to language is concerned, the structuralists are are, are not despaired of this um, of this uh, linguistic medium that is uh, that has been um, that, that that they are that they rely on. So it seems fairly reasonable for them because it is quite orderly. Whereas the post-structuralist, they have realized that since any, any understanding of the world could be achieved only through language and this language is unstable at best the, and there is no reality outside it, they have developed a certain anxiety about it, right? And uh, they realized that the entire system of signification is free, uh, is, is floating free, and hence no proper signification could be assigned to a particular sign. And this linguistic liquidity defies any attempt to carry signification carefully from the giver to it, and hence the meanings of words are unpure and contaminated. Then we saw the aim of the structuralists, the objective. They basically question our way of structuring and categorizing reality and prompts us to break free of habitual modes of perception or categorization 
but it believes that we can thereby attain a more reliable view of things see this is the main you know difference between the structuralist and the post structuralist the structuralist still despite understanding that uh, 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 asking us to break free from from the habitual modes of perception that is our um, asking us to break away from our uh, um, our practiced way of looking at the world it still believes that we can attain a more reliable view of things but as the post structuralist they completely distrust any notion of reason any notion of reason they they believe there is no black and white there are only grays right and there are only shades of grays they prefer the notion of dissolved or constructed a subject as in they realize that everything can be dissolved and everything is constructed okay it does not nothing nothing is fixed nothing is fixed per se and the individual is merely a product of social and linguistic forces so there is no essence to the individual anymore so you cannot call a certain person something merely because he claims to be every person is a product of the society and the linguistic forces that he belongs to or he lives in okay so there is only tissues of textualities tissues of textualities it's in everything is looked at through language through a text now we also saw um the origin of uh, of post structuralism as to it where, where it developed and who the pioneers were and whether Bath's uh, shift from or the shifting of loyalties, we could call it from structuralism to post structuralism and the reasons behind it. And we also saw uh, how structuralism was more detailed, methodological, ordered, and technical according to Bath's in his The Structural Analysis of Narrative. And, uh, and just a few years later, in The Pleasure of the Text, how he sees, you know, how he sees language. and random and subjective and fragmented and for it you know all these adjectives seem to contribute to the making of a text as in a text the making of a language or making of the meanings of words well in his another book in box another book the death of the author um, written right during his structuralist period what means or the pivotal period when he turned away from structuralism to post structuralism we see how he asserted the independence of the literary text away taking it away from the hands of the of the writer and take giving it giving it a, a, an independence that was never before seen so it was no more the sole uh, domain of the author but the reader so with the birth of the reader with the death of the author came the birth of the reader and uh, yes he freed the text from all forms of textual authority now this could be applied or this has been applied to the to normal communications because once a word is spoken spoken out loud by a speaker it no longer belongs to the speaker it could be taken or understood in any way one wants by the hearer by the receiver <coughs> now we saw a little bit about how this textual permissiveness that has been suggested by Bath earlier or even uh, Derrida has been sort of tempered and disciplined by Barbara Johnson later. She turned this textual permissiveness to a certain textual republicanism. Uh, in her books, the fame of reference, apostrophe, animation, and abortion, uh, metaphor, metonymy, and voice, in their eyes were watching God. You know, most of her books, they are more methodological than, but they are, sorry, they are more methodical than any of the other writings you could call them. Uh, even though the others were had some ground rules with which to work, Barbara Johnson really uh, tamed uh, the idea of deconstruction because she she believed that deconstruction is not a hedonistic abandonment of all restraint but disciplined identification and dismantling of the sources of textual power. By dismantling, you get into the depths, into the chasms that were, um, were, that were, that were inaccessible before. Right? She moved her insights of deconstruction into areas such as feminisms of African American studies and cultural studies, her attention to differences within engaged not only language, but politics, popular culture, and power of differentiation to both oppress and express particular subjects. Right? So she applied it, it was more of an applied deconstruction. Deconstruction itself is nothing but applied post structuralism, but Barbara Johnson 
made it further, brought it a little more into the realm, brought it into the realms of the other disciplines as well. Now, as far as Jacques Derrida is concerned, we just hinted upon him, yes, oh, in our previous lecture. We saw that his, uh, uh, an essay, a particular lecture, Structure, Sign and Play in the Discourse of the Human Sciences in 1966, was the, could, you could call it the founding stone for, um, for deconstruction. It or, or, or post structuralism or deconstruction. See, he believed or he proposed in his essay, in his lecture, that uh, certain intellectual events affected a radical break from the past ways of thought and, and basically they were connected with the philosophy of Nietzsche and Heidegger and also the psychoanalysis of Freud. So it com encompassed both philosophy and psychoanalysis. And speaking of his. Uh, of it, he shows how a certain norm or center was taken for granted, and this was questioned. This was uh, the entire center was decentered. The the Renaissance held that man is a measure of all things in the universe. Again, man was the center of beings, right? Man was the center of everything in the universe. Even man was pushed to the periphery. Man was decentered. The I, this idea itself was decentered. Again, the centers and margins they were. They were merged, they were interspersed, and they were floating freely after this intellectual event, or you could call it, it was not merely an intellectual event, it's, it was the, the culmination of various things that happened during the First World War, and the scientific uh, inventions and discoveries and theories, oh, and all of these contributed to the making of this intellectual event he speaks of, that broke, uh, you know, the, broke us away from the past ways of thinking. A couple with, of course, the philosophy of Nietzsche and Heidegger and, and psychoanalysis of Freud. So the center that was white western norms of dress, behavior, architecture and intellectual outlook and the margins that were any aberration, deviation and variation from the center, these were no longer fixed in, fixed in specific boxes. They, they could not be, uh, they, they rather lost their their uh, boundaries, their lines, yeah, that, that demarcated one from the other. Now, speaking of the decentering of the okay, these were the events that contributed to the, the of, of the way we started thinking about everything about the centers and the margins, the historic events, and the scientific discoveries, intellectual and artistic revolutions. All of these contributed. I wouldn't go into all of these once again. I'm just giving you a brief recap so as to give you a continuum, a sense of continuum for our today's topic. So these were the, these were the things that contributed to the making of the uh, of the new way of thinking. Now Derrida, Barth, and Nietzsche, they. Um, or in their own ways, they in their own ways contributed to the making of the deconstruction, deconstructing the world itself. Um, see, what they did was instead of movement or deviation from a known center, all we have is free play, so it's liberating. And we found that Barthes and Nietzsche, they suggest we better start, you know, um, uh, appreciating this liberation. We, we better start. Uh, instead of trying to figure out what happened, why it happened, let's let's begin to accept that it happened. Okay, let's uh, uh, you know enjoy the liberation that has been uh, given to us as a gift and that has been gifted us. So Nietzschean universe, which has no facts but only interpretations, with no stamp of authority upon it, as there is no longer an authoritative center to which to appeal for validation for our interpretations. And he, he with this with this attitude, he tells us not to turn away from the as yet unnameable. Unnameable because we are in the unknown, you know, unknown areas. Now, Derrida's deconstructive reading, uh, I put it in here under, um, you know, his this topic mainly because these three works, these uh, speech and phenomena of grammatology, writing and difference, even though we'll be looking into of grammatology a little more than the rest, basically these three texts are sort of. Uh, so what we see is all of these books are mainly uh, philosophical rather than literary 
um, literary critical treatise as such. So what you see is in, in most of these books, especially in of, of grammatology, he deals mainly with, uh, you know, uh, theories proposed by various um, various other philosophers and writers. Like uh, he goes on to speak of uh, Sostia, he speaks of uh, Rousseau and Heidegger and Nietzsche, all of these um, all of these philosophers and thinkers he speaks of and the theories proposed to, proposed by them and basically arrives at this one particular uh, particular conclusion that all texts all texts are deconstructed or literary literary any literary text is deconstructed to show that the the previously unified uh, the universe that we live in itself is decentered. Uh, he treats uh, the text to to uh, through deconstruction make them emblems of a decentered universe. So texts previously seen as unified artistic artifacts, fragment were, were nothing but fragmented, self divided, and and centerless. As in the monstrous verse predicted at the end of Structure, Sign and Play, uh, in Structure, Sign and Play, he showed how because of certain events, or oh, you know, or monstrous births were created. So this, this itself, you know, any artistic artifact would be now seen as fragmented, self-divided, and centerless. Now uh, we look a little more closely into of grammatology as. Uh, Mm, as Peter Barry has given it much thought and interest. So basically, he starts off, Barry, Peter Barry starts off, that there is nothing outside the text. Now, this particular idea that has been quoted often enough by various uh, writers and thinkers in uh, different contexts, Peter Barry believes that it needs to be understood a little more closely, a little more, um, you know, and try to understand the ground on which this particular thought was laid okay because this thought tells you that all reality is gives you the understanding that all reality is linguistic no meaningful talk of a real world which exists outside of language is possible right so there is no meaningful talk of a real world is possible outside of language now speak or to understand this uh, you know the context behind this particular sentence or axiom you, oh, we need to look at at least uh, Peter Barry tells us to look into this particular section in of gram grammatology the exorbitant question of method and in this section we find Derrida discussing Rousseau's essay on the origin of language Rousseau's uh, is this particular essay is being discussed by Derrida in this particular section in of grammatology while he is trying to interpret I use the word interpret here because he is discussing this particular essay of another writer, another thinker. While he is trying to interpret Rousseau's essay, he questions his own methodology. Okay, He is questioning his own method of interpreting the text and the nature of all interpretation. So I am trying to convey to you a certain idea proposed by another person. Now I do not know for sure what that person intended. Okay, I do not know what the other person intended. I give you my understanding of that person's text. Text, not the intended text. I am telling you what I understood from the text or the idea proposed by that person. Right? So here, my interpretation of that person's text is bound to be corrupted by my own inclinations, prejudices, deviations of thought, all of it. Right? So I am bound to question my method of interpreting rather than lay any claim, claim to giving 100% perfect interpretation of whatever that person said or convey the meaning of the text without any corruption, without any, without leaving off any particular uh, or major idea behind, right? So we, it, it is only natural, it is only human to accept that our mode of interpretation is bound to be corrupt. Now what we understand is that language stands in the place of reality, right? Language seems to stand in the place of reality and to understand any reality, to see reality, we require language. So language is 
replacing reality or supplementing reality somehow. See, I observe a certain event somewhere and I come and comment upon it to you. So while I am discussing its details, I am using a certain language to convey it chronologically, the, the, the narrative, right? I, I try to tell you in brief steps, in my own way, with whatever words that come to my head, whatever happened in that particular situation. So what is happening here is technically language itself is replacing or supplementing, replacing in a sense, the reality happened elsewhere and I am telling you about it. So through language, language is replacing the reality. And also when, you know, to, to supplement it, to make it more colorful or maybe to bring it to life, I use further adjectives and adverbs to make it more or certain abstract nouns to make it more interesting for you to supplement the the, the narrative I am giving it, giving you, right? So the language seems to stand in the place of reality. Now the person writing, or here the writing would imply both speaking and writing. Okay. Now the person writing in a text is inscribed in a determined textual system. So what he says is that I am using certain words that are already there already there in this uh, in this linguistic construct and I choose whatever I want out of that particular you know um, the science I, I, I use whatever signs are necessary for me or whatever I can hold on to or whatever I can access and use them for my own purpose so this person the person who has already written is inscribed in a determined textual system it has already been determined it has been already decided okay this textual system is already in existence within which the person who is speaking or writing is inscribed is is living inside it okay so what ultimately what we realize is that we all inherit language inherit language as in it has been i am not creating language okay i am not the one who is create I, I may be using language i cannot create language I, I am using language that has been that i have inherited and i have inherited it not not um not in bits and pieces it is a ready-made system with all its own with its own history philosophy with its with its etymology with its culture philology everything it, you know a language that has come to me no matter what language we are talking about irrespective of uh, uh, the divides here between English, Urdu, Tamil, whatever whatever language it is, I have inherited this language with its own set of history, with its own set of philosophy and, and, and so on already built in. So if I am going to use a certain word, say I am using a word from Tamil, okay, that word I may not use it, okay, it may have certain different meanings, uh, different connotations in different contexts, right? So if I am not familiar with a certain context in which it, it, it's meaning in a certain context and I use it inadvertently, I may end up uh, making a fool of myself, right? Because I have not used it properly. The language is not at fault here. I am at fault. I have inherited the system and I should be aware of the system. If my, my, if my ignorance is uh, creating a certain dilemma for me, it is not me, it is not the system at fault, it is me at fault. Okay, I am digressing here, but the point here is, uh, I just wanted you to understand how language seems to behave, or, or how Derrida believes language seems to behave, or uh, how the relationship between us and the language, humans and the language. So we don't express ourselves in words, merely some aspect of language. So we are not using words here. So generally, we tend to believe that just because we can increase our vocabulary, we can speak, just by increasing our vocabulary, we may be able to speak, uh, you know, speak well. The idea is not merely the words, it is, it is the aspect, some aspect, everything, okay? Language is not merely constructed of words. So the writer writes in a language and in a logic, and it has to be italicized, I forgot to italicize, forgive me. The writer writes in a language and in a logic whose proper systems, laws and life of his discourse, by definition, 
cannot dominate absolutely. Please look at it again. The writer writes in a language. He is writing in a language, in a logic, with a certain logic behind, whose proper systems, laws and life, his discourse by definition <coughs> cannot dominate absolutely. So his discourse is not going to dominate the language at all. Because the language and the logic has already is is uh, you know is pre-existing. It it is a proper system. It has its own system. It has its own laws. It has its own life. And one person who is using making use of the language and the logic cannot completely dominate it, because that particular text. See, for instance, uh, I I I write something. I write something. I believe which is my idea using a certain language using a certain logic and I believe this is this work is from me from me okay me being the operative word here but he says I cannot dominate the neither the language nor the logic in the work that I have created mainly because both language and logic has had its purpose, is, is a complete system, it has its own laws, it has its own life. So I can only try to manipulate it to some extent, but cannot master it. So it would, I, I mean, I may, with a certain intention when I write something, my intention takes a backstage. Once it is written down, once it is spoken out, it takes its own life. It has its own life. Alright. So he uses them. Who uses them? The writer. He uses them by only letting himself be governed by the system. So what I am doing is I am allowing myself to be governed by the system. So I cannot create my own new syntax that does not make any sense to anyone. I cannot change the structure, I cannot change a meaning, I cannot change a certain connotation. Maybe through certain practices, certain, uh, through certain, uh, mm, you know, uh, uh, through maybe some tradition behind it. Yes, certain new connotations could be created. But I cannot govern it. I am supposed to be governed by it. And the reading must always aim at a certain relationship. The reading should always aim at a certain relationship unperceived by the writer. See, when you read something, you don't have to think about the author at all because the author is clueless about what he has written. Yes, he may have written something with a certain intention, but the reader is the one who interprets or, or, or manipulates the text to mean something. Right? Between what the what he commands and what he does not command of the patterns of the language that he uses, the relationship is not a certain quantitative distribution of shadow and light, of weakness or of force, but a signifying structure that so it cannot be specifically defined or, or uh, delineated. Uh, no proper delineation is possible between shadow and light or weakness of force or but a signifying structure that critical reading should produce. A critical reading ultimately has to produce something like this. Reading and interpretation or not just reproducing what the writer thought and expressed in the text. This inadequate notion of interpretation, Derrida calls a doubling commentary. See, reading and interpretation or not merely reproducing what the writer thought and expressed. Okay, this this is highly inadequate. This is highly inadequate as in you are going to reproduce everything the writer says but it merely is a doubling comment. Since it tries to reconstruct a pre-existing non-textual reality of what the writer did or thought to lay alongside the text. Because see this doubling commentary I mean when you are reading and interpreting what you're doing is a giving a, is a double commentary because it is trying to reconstruct a pre-existing non-textual reality something that does not belong to the reality something that has that is already in existence of what the writer did or thought to lay alongside the text so you are going to look 
or skip over the author and go beyond it. Okay. Critical reading must produce the text since there is nothing behind it for us to reconstruct. See, critical reading should produce the text, not reproduce. So, reading and interpretation are not reproducing. Okay, it is producing. It is producing the text since there is nothing behind it for us to reconstruct. Reading then has to be deconstructive rather than reconstructive. So, you go beyond and behind the author and do the, do the signifying structure to the entire system, linguistic system to decipher what uh, what the text means or rather than what the text what the, uh, the author intended there is nothing outside the text so you need to live into the text to you need to look into the text so that is that is a point um you know derrida tries to make which is solely misinterpreted most of the time okay Reading cannot legitimately transgress the text towards something other than it or toward a signified outside the text whose content should take place, could take place, could have taken place as regards the absence of the referent or the transcendental signified. There is nothing outside the text. See, reading cannot legitimately transgress the text. Reading cannot no, transgress the text. Toward something that it does not signify, toward a signified outside the text, something which something that could exist outside it, you cannot read that. You, you cannot take the text to it, whose content could take place, could have taken place as regards the absence of the referent. You know, in, in the absence of a referent, you you cannot do any, any of it. You cannot transgress the text. So there is hence nothing outside the text. Beyond and behind what one believes can be circumscribed as Rousseau's text, there has never been anything but writing. What opens meaning and language is writing as the disappearance of natural presence. See, now I, I want you to focus on this particular line. What opens meaning and language is writing as the disappearance of natural presence. When the natural presence is lost or disappears, meaning and language is created in writing. Okay, or not created, but is revealed in writing. So this is one question I want you to ponder upon and discuss the relationship drawn by Derrida between the word and the world. Okay, please think about it. Now, uh, before I proceed further, there are some three points I want you to consider. Deconstruction, we've discussed it at length, aporia, and logocentrism. Basically, I want you to work on all of these three and try to decipher or, um, its meanings, its definitions. And also, I want you to think about it in uh, terms of a certain literary, particular literary text, if possible. And we'll further continue our discussion in our next lecture. So far, stay safe, be happy. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum.